It's just a, it's a green slide that says zero carbon. Yes. It does. Yes. Okay, great. All right, thanks. Thanks. Uh, sorry for that little pause there, a little technical difficulty. Well, hello, everyone, and good evening. And uh, thank you very much to the Boxborough Sustainability Committee for hosting this webinar this evening and doing an incredible job of spreading the word on this essential topic, especially to Franzi Nold, who orchestrated it, and Suresh uh, Jasrasaria, who'll be, feed, who'll be the MC tonight and feeding me questions that you put into the Q&A uh, function at the bottom of the, the page there. There'll be four breaks in the presentation, and I'll take questions from the Q and A at the end of each one. And then at the end of the uh, at the end of the webinar, um, Suresh will open it up for, for live questions, and I will stay on as long as it takes until everyone's question gets answered. So, uh, if you have a question tonight about your house or your town or what you need to be doing, what makes sense for you, you can ask it tonight, and I will try my best to answer it for you. Now, I'll be speaking tonight mostly about our own experience cutting our home's carbon footprint to zero and making a 15% return on investment by doing so. That's right, you heard me correctly. You now get paid to cut your carbon footprint. 10 years ago, it cost a lot of money. Now you make money. This is disruptive, to use the language of business. It's an inflection point. We are entering a new era and this is the point of no return. So welcome to the future, everyone. It's a zero carbon future. Uh, we talked about logistics, so I'll, just, I'll skip right over that. So this is what happened on our house. Um, we were, our carbon emissions were about 30 to 35 tons per year back in the early years. And then at the end of 2016, we added solar panels to the roof and heat pumps to replace our decrepit air conditioning units. And uh, those combined during 2017 cut our carbon footprint by about two thirds, by about 20 tons per year. Um, and then at the end of 2017, we, which actually means me, I installed insulation, just fiberglass, I just pushed it up in, in between the, the, the joists on the floors from the basement. Um, and uh, we added triple glazed windows to replace our ancient 1970s vintage and falling apart single and double glazed windows uh, that we had in the house before then. And um, so when we did that, that cut our carbon footprint a further 50% but by about five tons, making it about five tons. And um, uh, so what I thought then is, hey, this is, this is pretty good. I've cut this a long way from 35 tons to five tons. Maybe I can just push it a bit further and get to zero and wouldn't that be cool? So we installed an extra solar panel array over the roof of our garage in um, uh, the end of 2018. And that cut our carbon footprint for the full year of 2019 to zero and in fact, slightly below zero. Um, so our, our entire carbon footprint of, um, of 35 tons is gone. Now, 35 tons is about equivalent to taking 10 gasoline cars off the road. So one house, 10 cars. This is huge. Now, cutting carbon emissions also cuts emissions of things like sulfur dioxide, which causes acid rain, nitric oxides, and particulates, all of which cause asthma. Um, all of this pollution causes, causes asthma and other, other breathing difficulties. And now this is important. A recent Harvard University study, excuse me, estimates that more than 8 million people died as a result of fossil fuel pollution in 2018, from strokes to cancer, nearly double the number previously thought. And this accounts for nearly one in five deaths worldwide that year, one in five deaths caused by fossil fuel pollution. It is really stunning what fossil fuels are doing to us. They are literally killing us. Now, what was even more of a surprise than actually getting to zero, which itself was a surprise because the conventional wisdom when I started this was that you could get to zero on a new house, but you could not do it on an existing house. I've obviously proved that to be completely wrong, but what was more than a surprise, more than a surprise of just getting to zero was the amount of money I'm saving. I'm saving $11,000 a year between heating and electricity bills. And that is earning me a 15% return on investment. That's about, that's 15% after tax and it's indexed for inflation, which I don't know about you, but it's far better than my 401k. So let's just look at the energy bills. Here they are. It was about $11,000 in the early years, cut following exactly the carbon footprint, excuse me, cut in 2017 by the heat pumps and the solar panels, again in 2018 with the insulation and the triple glazed windows, and then again in 2019 with those extra solar panels on the roof of our garage. So it's 35 tons, gone. 35 tons each year, every year, and forever and $11,000 each year, every year, and forever in my back pocket, giving me that 15% return on investment each year, every year, and forever. So you may be wondering, well, David's got a big house and he lives in Dover, and that's one of the wealthiest towns in Massachusetts. 
will this work for me? And the answer is yes. Um, one homeowner has applied my approach and he is earning a 46% per year return on investment by cutting his carbon footprint 38%. This man is elderly, he lives alone, he lives in a small house on a small income. His approach works for all houses at all income levels. So this is big. This delivers the triple bottom line for the people, for the pollution, for the planet, global warming, and for the profit, you'll be making more money as a result of doing this. So, um, so this webinar is gonna show you how to do it. So Suresh gave a wonderful introduction, uh, but he's a bit, a bit more about me. I did that degree in physics from Oxford. I got that, I'm a Brit if you can't tell by my accent. Um, I got the MBA from Harvard Business School. I founded two biotech companies. Um, and then I had this nasty road accident in the summer of 2014 that nearly killed me. Um, and I, I took time off work to recover. And it was while I was at home, I did the research on cutting carbon footprints and uh, started to implement it as I mentioned in the, in the previous slides. Um, so now both my house and my swimming pool have uh, zero carbon footprints. I'm saving $11,000 a year on the house and $3,000 on the pool. I wrote one book about each one because um, I realized that this, this really was an inflection point. This, was, this could really change things dramatically. So I wanted to write a book to get the word out there. That book became a webinar, and here we are. And I do not work for or get paid by any supplier or installer of equipment. I'm retired from my biotech career. Um, and uh, so I have no financial conflict of interest, I'm not trying to sell you anything tonight. Uh, I do sell the book for $25 for the paperback, 15 bucks for the ebook, but you're all going to get that for free. Uh, at the end of this, uh, the webinar, I'll give you a code. You can just go to my website and download it for free. Uh, I do consult some home homeowners have asked me to help them uh, to go zero, but I only get paid on results. So even that's not really a conflict of interest either. And my advice this evening is based on my experience, but neither me nor the company. Um, is giving investment or tax or legal or financial advice, and we're not providing any guarantee of results either. Now, I'm not going to tell you tonight that you need to be vegetarian, that you need to turn down your thermostat, that you need to wear a cardigan like Jimmy Carter did, or bike to work, have fewer children, or even vote for Al Gore. In fact, I don't care who you vote for. I don't care whether you believe climate change is a Chinese hoax or an existential risk to humanity. I'm just going to talk about saving money, saving money by cutting your carbon footprint. That's something I think we can all agree on. In fact, I'm not really going to tell you to do anything tonight. I'm just going to show you what we did that worked and a few things that we did or didn't do that didn't work. Um, so it is pure coincidence or perhaps destiny that our family name really is green. I got it from my father. I'm not making it up, just like I'm not making up anything else in this presentation. So there's a lot of data in this, in this presentation tonight. So how was that data gathered? And the short answer is from our house. Our house is a two-story 5,400 square foot house is built in 1974, so it's a bit bigger than average. Um, but other than that, it's kind of standard. It's uh, two by four walls filled with fiberglass um, with some insulation uh, on the roof. And then I've added insulation to the ceiling of the basement. Before we went zero, it had no energy efficiency features whatsoever. In fact, it's a pretty energy inefficient house. And as I mentioned, we live in Dover. Um, and so that has 5,800 heating degree days. Heating degree days are a measure of how cold it gets in the wintertime and therefore how much fuel you need to heat your house. And uh, that's about the same for all the way across New England, all the way across the Midwest, and even into Northern California. So each day for two years, I measured the heating oil use and the electricity used by a home. Yeah, that's right. I'm, I'm kind of an Excel uh, uh, guru and I actually like this stuff, kind of getting the data to get to the bottom of the problem. That's really the, the physicist in me. And I use this data to build an energy model of how our home uh, leaks energy and how much it costs to heat. And uh, that model has an 80% R-squared. R-squared is a statistical measure for how good a model is, and 80% is very good. Um, and it, it projects the full year build within about 10%. And this is Gen 1 of the model. I'm currently on about Gen 5, because I use this model in my consulting work. Um, and, the, and the Gen 5 model is accurate about 5%. So a very good way to, uh, to predict the change in the heating load of the house um, when you do things like add insulation and triple glazed windows. And then I use that energy model, this is where the MBA in me now takes over, I use that energy model to make financial projections. I know the cost of a gallon of heating oil, the cost of a therm of, of uh, natural gas, and the cost of a kilowatt hour of electricity. So it's pretty easy to turn these energy savings into cash flow projections. And I use standard discounted cash flow analysis, which they teach at Harvard Business School and every other business school on the planet, which uses cash flow based um, analysis to, to calculate things like net present value, which is basically how much profit you make on the investment measured in dollars, 
and um, the IRR or internal rate of return, which is the return on investment measured in percentage, like 5% or 10% per year. And then the payback period, which is how many years it takes for the savings to pay back the investment you made up from. And I measured the cut in energy use and the dollars for each one of the fab four as we added them. And I've used a very similar method for our rental property and with our, our consulting clients, excuse me. So by doing this, I could tell which things made energy sense and which ones made financial sense. And what I found is that there were only four things um, that made both energy sense and financial sense. And that was heat pumps, insulation, triple glazed windows and solar panels. And what I found was there were several things which are actually quite popular in the green building community or the deep energy retrofit community um, that, uh, that didn't make any financial sense. They made energy sense, things like geothermal, made energy sense, but did not make financial sense. Things like um, uh, solar hot water panels made energy sense, but not financial sense. And taking off the siding from your house, thickening the walls with insulation, putting the siding back on again, again, makes energy sense, but no financial sense. And so, um, so it was really the combination of these two that allowed me to isolate the things that made both energy sense and made financial sense. And that's what we did, heat pumps, insulation, triple glazed windows and solar panels. Um, so you may be asking yourself, well, why, why can we do this now when we haven't been able to do this for decades, even though environmentalists have been talking about doing this kind of stuff for decades. And it's really because the technology has got much better. The technologies of insulation have got much better than they used to be. Heat pumps are dramatically better than they used to be. Solar panels are just much cheaper. They're a little bit better, but they're much, much cheaper than they used to be. And triple glazed windows are now eight times better than their single glazed ancestors from the 1970s. So there's really, really been huge innovation throughout the industry and it's allowed you to physically cut your, um, your energy use dramatically. And in addition to all of that, the subsidies from government are very significant, particularly in Massachusetts, particularly on, on the coasts, less so in the center of the country, but on the coasts, uh, the, the subsidies from government are very large. And so by following these examples, you can cut the carbon emissions from your home to zero, you can save thousands of dollars a year on heat, heating and electricity bills and make a good return on your investment. We have done it. And by the way, although most of what I'm going to talk about tonight is about renovations, in other words, existing houses and what you can do to cut their carbon footprint, this approach works on new houses too. I've just finished the work for my first client um, on a new house. He's building a new house down on the Cape. Um, and uh, the, the, the modeling went extremely well. And um, so this, this approach works just as well on new houses. In fact, it works better on new houses because you can get everything right the first time rather than having to take something apart to make it right the second time. Um, so how did we cut our carbon footprint to zero? Well, we installed the Fab Four, heat pumps, insulation, triple glazed windows and solar panels. This is easy to remember because the real Fab Four, of course, that's the Beatles. I know I'm a Brit, I'm sure it shows, had lots of hits, HOTS, heat pumps, insulation, triple glazed windows and solar panels. So how did we go zero and make money? We installed the Fab Four and we got all the tax breaks and subsidies. So I'm gonna go through each one of these in turn, heat pumps first, then we'll take a break at the end of the heat pump section and ask a couple of questions from the chat. Suresh will just pass those to me. And then we'll do the next section that will keep us on time so we don't go, go too long tonight. But then at the end, if you've got questions, we'll open up the live questions and I'll stay on as long as it takes to get everyone's questions answered. So heat pumps first, this was the single biggest cut in our carbon footprint, almost halved our carbon footprint by about 20 tons per year, saving us about $3,000 a year. This is the, um, the reduction in the cost of the heating oil and the increase in the cost of the electricity. So this is the net of those two. It costs us about $26,000 to replace our, um, uh, to add the heat pumps and they'll pay for themselves in about nine years, giving a return on investment of about 9% after tax. Now that's the, um, that's the economics of, of the savings. In addition to that, an article published in Nature Energy, probably the most prestigious journal in, um, in the field just last year, reported a four to 7% price increase for houses that have heat pumps compared to similar houses that don't have heat pumps. Now this translates to a premium of somewhere between 10 and $20,000 for most houses, uh, which is roughly what it would cost you to install a heat pump on most houses. This means you no longer have to wait for the payback period of nine years to get your money back. You can get your money back as soon as you sell your house. Um, so the, yeah, the, uh, the heat pumps I'm talking about here are air source heat pumps in contrast to geothermal, sometimes called ground source heat pumps. Uh, we had a quote for geothermal on our house. It was $98,000. That is four times the cost of air source heat pumps. Now, geothermal is a bit more efficient than air source. No doubt about it. It's just the physics. Um, 
but uh, that that is nowhere near enough to make up the cost difference. You could buy four sets of uh, aerosol heat pumps for the cost of geothermal. Now this is with electricity at 23 cents per kilowatt hour. Now where you are in Boxborough with Littleton Electric at about 13 cents per kilowatt hour, which is dirt cheap by the way, you guys should be very, very happy with your uh, electricity supplier. Um, your heat pumps are gonna be very good value for money. Um, usually when I, when I give this, uh, this webinar, I talk about the need for heat pumps and solar panels because using heat pumps on Eversource or national grid electricity at 23 cents per kilowatt hour is gonna get expensive. You'll reduce your carbon footprint, but it'll probably cost you more to heat your house, unless you have solar panels to reduce your cost of electricity. Uh, and, and with the Littleton uh, um, uh, supplier, um, you probably don't really need to because 13 cents per kilowatt hour divided by the average efficiency of, of uh, aerosol heat pumps in New England, which is about 2.5 times, is about 5 cents for every kilowatt hour of heat in the house. That's about the same as natural gas. So, um, and yet you'll, you'll cut your carbon footprint dramatically by doing that, but, and your bills will be about the same. Um, that's if you just stick with Littleton Electric. If you uh, do go with solar panels as well, and you've got a reasonably sunny roof, I'll get onto this later, uh, a reasonably sunny roof, you can make power at five, six, seven, eight cents per kilowatt hour, which is far cheaper than even Littleton Electric. So um, because your electricity is so cheap, um, a lot of these things you can do just, just right away without having to have solar panels. But for many people, even in Boxborough, um, with a reasonably sunny roof, you're going to find solar panels are going to dramatically cut your electricity bill, uh, even from the low rates in, in Littleton. Uh, here's a picture of our heat pumps. And if you're saying to yourself right now, well, these look just like my air conditioning units, you're exactly right. They do, and they are. Uh, they, they, they act as air conditioning units in the summertime. And these replaced our old AC units from the 1970s that were, were totally decrepit. Um, and uh, they cool the house in the summertime. Uh, but in the wintertime, the circuit is reversed. I'll explain this in a minute. And uh, they heat the house in the wintertime. And when they heat, they heat with two and a half times the efficiency of a furnace or a boiler. Even the most efficient natural gas furnace, which is currently about 95% efficient, the heat pumps are still two and a half times as efficient as that. They cool with the same efficiency as an AC unit. Um, so uh, this is, uh, this is how, let me explain now how, um, how heat pumps actually work. Um, so uh, most people find heat pumps kind of confusing, that the most confusing of these four big technologies I'm going to talk about. But in fact, everyone is familiar with a heat pump because your refrigerator is one. So if you put your hand down the back of your refrigerator, you'll see there's those uh, long squiggly black metal pipes. That is um, where the heat comes out from the heat pump. The heat pump moves heat, it doesn't create heat. It's like a water pump, it moves water, it does not create water. And um, so the heat from inside your refrigerator is being moved to the back of the fridge, cooling down the inside, cooling down your milk, and that heat is dumped to the air in the kitchen um, outside. So if you put your head, hand down the back, you'll find it's warm down there. In fact, I remember when I was a, a kid, my mother used to start trays of seedlings up on top of the refrigerator because it was warm up there and the seedlings would germinate faster. Now, imagine that refrigerator on a larger scale, the size of your house. Now it's pumping the heat out of your house and dumping the heat outside, not inside like it is in the kitchen, but outside to the outside air. That is your air conditioning unit. It's a heat pump and it's moving heat just the way a, a water pump moves water. It's moving it from one place to another. It's moving the heat from inside the house to the outside of the house. And then that, that heat is then dispersed to the outside air. So if you were to put your hand over the top of your air conditioning unit in summertime, you've probably done this, it's really hot. It may be 80 degrees in the air outside, but it's 110 degrees over your air conditioning unit because it's got all that heat in it that was inside your house that has been moved outside and dumped to the outside air. Now imagine reversing that circuit, you're now pumping the heat into the house, making the inside of the house hotter and making the outside of the house colder. Now this is where it gets a bit counterintuitive to people because in the wintertime it's cold out already and people ask themselves well how can the air have heat in it if it's so cold out. Well, a physicist will tell you there's plenty of heat left in that air and you can take that heat, but the effect of doing so is to cool down that air outside. So you can warm up your house inside, but you cool down the air outside. And let me show you how this works. Here's me and I'm holding an infrared thermometer. So I'm just measuring the temperature here. 
Uh, you can see the heat pump there at the top of the left-hand picture, and I'm measuring the outside temperature as the air goes into the heat pump. You can see it's 4.7 degrees Fahrenheit. It was a very cold winter day. You can see the snow on the ground, and I'm wearing skiing gloves. Now on the right-hand picture, I'm measuring the temperature over the top of the um, the uh, heat pump, and you can see it's minus 19.6 degrees Fahrenheit. It's unbelievably cold, 25 degrees colder than the outside air temperature. So in fact, this is so cold, if you put your hand over it without gloves, you'd get frostbite. So um, this is showing you how the heat is being pumped into my house, even from that cold outside air, but it makes that air even colder still. And this is how a heat pump works to heat your house in the winter. This is at uh, my home where I am right now. Uh, these are the heat pumps that are heating the house right now. Now, this picture here is a, is a rental property, which is different. Our, our house had uh, ductwork for the um, air conditioning and the heating before, and it was a forced hot air heating system before we put in the heat pumps. This is our rental property, which did not have air conditioning. And we put the air conditioning in and we put in the heat pumps, uh, which both uh, cool in the summer and heat in the winter. And you can see the outdoor unit there. And then the indoor units, I paid a bit extra for the ceiling mounted ones. These are often wall mounted or sometimes floor mounted, but I prefer the look of the, um, the ceiling mounted ones. And um, this, this works at our rental property, which did not have duct work. And so if you don't have duct work, uh, and you don't have any air, air conditioning either, um, then this is a good solution using what are called mini split heat pumps, um, which are uh, uh, a little trickier to install than the previous ones, which basically just replaced our air conditioning units. The, the installers literally took away the old air conditioning units, put in the new ones on the same pad, and, and they even plugged into the same breakers in the electrical panel. Uh, the ones at our, our home are, are made by Bosch, and uh, these ones, excuse me, at our rental property are made by Mitsubishi. Now, if you don't have duct work, this is probably uh, the best way to go um, because they will, um, they will give you the benefits of the heat pump without having to add duct work, which is very expensive on, on houses that already exist. Um, so let's just summarize where we are so far, then I'll take a few questions. Um, for details, you can see, please read chapter two. So this webinar is about 45 minutes long. It's intended to be an overview. The book has far more details. If you want to read up more on um, how these things work and how to finance them. Um, I don't recommend geothermal, as I mentioned. Oh, you all get this book for free, by the way. Also, if you're, um, sorry, I should have mentioned this earlier on. There's a copy of the, um, of the slides. It's available on my website. You can just download that as a PDF file for free. So uh, there's no need to write anything down. Um, you can just either read about it in the book, all these details are in the book, or you can just download my slides, um, print them out and, and uh, read them separately if you want. Uh, so I don't recommend geothermal, as I mentioned, uh, the ground source heat pumps, they will cut your carbon footprint, uh, but they are way too expensive compared to air source heat pumps. One of those things that makes energy sense, but does not make financial sense. Now, air source heat pumps work with radiators, with forced hot water systems, as well as with uh, existing AC ductwork or with no AC uh, ductwork, um, like I showed you at our rental property. Uh, they also work on swimming pools. My, my swimming pool is uh, heated with a heat pump, far more efficient than, than my old propane furnace. Um, and they do hot, they heat hot water tanks as well. Uh, and I'll show you, uh, now I don't have a picture of mine in here, um, <clears throat> but our, our hot water is not heated from, uh, the furnace is not used anymore, um, but it's not used to heat the hot water either. Uh, the, heat, the hot water is, he is heated with a heat pump hot water tank which looks just like a regular water, hot water tank, but with a, about an extra 18 inches on top where the heat pump is. Um, and leave your furnace in place um, as a backup uh, source of heating. Should the electricity uh, grid go down, you can run your, um, your uh, oil burner circuit and circulating fans, etc., off your uh, propane generator or off your battery backup uh, uh, source of electricity. Uh, during a grid outage. So, so to just leave your furnace in place, there's, there's really no point in, in taking it out. So let's just uh, pause here, uh, Suresh, and see if there's any questions from the chat. Thank you, David. Thanks for uh, an excellent uh, primer on uh, heat pumps. Uh, there are a couple of very interesting questions. Uh, first okay. question is, uh, how much does uh, your electricity bill increase with heat pumps? Does heat pumps use electricity? Uh, so yes is, is the answer to both those questions. Yes, the heat pumps use electricity. There's no fuel used in the heat pump. It's just you plug it into your, your electrical panel the same way you'd plug in a, a water pump or something like that. It's just an appliance that uses electricity to move that heat around. And moving heat around is far more efficient than generating heat 
by burning even something like natural gas in a, in a very efficient furnace. Um, so that, that was the question about electricity. Uh, uh, the, the amount of electricity will go up because now you're using electricity to move that heat around, but your, um, your uh, use of, let's say you're on natural gas or heating oil will go down as this is exactly what happened in our house. So the amount of heating oil went down from 3000 gallons a year to about 150 gallons a year. And that's only for um, super cold days in the winter time when the heat pumps can't keep up. Um, and so the heating oil bill was cut to almost zero. And then the electricity bill went up. Um, I forget the exact amount, but it was the, the net of the two was a saving of about $3,000. So, I, uh, so I, I saved about, probably about $7,000 a year on the heating oil. So the increase must have been about $4,000 in the electricity, leaving with a net saving of about $3,000 overall. Did that answer, answer your question? Yes, that does answer the question that was asked. So uh, another interesting question uh, from uh, another uh, viewer. Um, he says, I have hydronic system radiators for heating. Can I use air to water heat pumps? and expect similar economics. Um, so I've never done what you are describing. Um, however, it is possible to do it. And um, if you leave your, your fossil fuel furnace in place, you're really not taking any risk because uh, you'll always have that backup fuel source in case the, um, the air to water system doesn't keep up with the heating load in your house, uh, which it probably won't in very cold weather. Uh, mine doesn't, mine's a forced hot air system, but it doesn't keep up about 20 days a year. When it's below about 20 degrees Fahrenheit outside, the heat pumps can't keep my house uh, completely warm at 70 degrees. And so I, I just turn on the, um, the fossil fuel furnace for a couple of hours is usually enough just to get it back up to 70 degrees and then the heat pumps can usually keep it there. So, um, so I, I definitely recommend leaving your furnace in place. Don't take it out. Um, but uh, the manufacturers of these um, air to water heat pumps are different to the manufacturers of the air to air heat pumps. So the manufacturers of the air to air ones are the same names you've heard of for air conditioning units. It's Carrier, Train, Bosch, Mitsubishi, Fujitsu, American Standard. All the companies that make air conditioning units make air, air source heat pumps for four star air heating systems. The companies that make heat pumps for air to water systems are different. Um, and off the top of my head, uh, Daikin, D-A-I-K-I-N is one of them. Uh, Jaga, J-A-G-A is another one, and Space Pack is the third. So there are companies that make these systems. I've never used one myself. Um, so I think if you are going to go this way, I would, I would first keep first keep your fossil fuel furnace in place. And the second thing, I would try to find a couple of people who've got one and, um, and just talk it through with them to find out if they had any issues with it. So it can be done, but I just haven't done it myself. So I can't tell you what the, the results have been. And one last question before you go to the third, uh, uh, before you go to the second uh, part of your talk. Um, one of the viewers is asking as to how much air sealing did you do uh, and how much insulation do you have before you started to get benefits from your heat pump? Um, so the next section is insulation. So let's use this as a bridge to, to that section. But the short answer is, um, there's no waiting period. Had I, in fact, I, I did put in the heat pumps before the insulation. So uh, I did exactly what you were suggesting. I got a big reduction in my uh, bills uh, from the heat pumps alone before I put the insulation in. When I put the insulation in, it cut down the heat loss in my house and that made the uh, heat pumps do less work. So I got sort of a double benefit then. I got the reduction in the heat loss from the insulation and then whatever heat was needed was generated very efficiently using my heat pumps. But, but let's hold off on that. Maybe we can come back to that in the live Q&A if I haven't answered your questions in the next section. But the next, next section is insulation and air sealing. So let's, um, Suresh, should we just move on? Yes, please. Um, okay. There are a couple other questions, but we'll bring them up uh, in the next section. Okay, great, thanks. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk about the second part of HITS, insulation. So insulation cut our carbon footprint about 16% or about seven tons per year, saving us more money than we saved with the heat pumps, although less of a carbon footprint reduction, over th almost $3,000 a year in uh, money savings. This only cost me about $1,000. And I paid for this myself. I probably could have got mass saved to pay for it, but I didn't really know about it back then. 
um, paying for itself in just a few months with a return on investment of over 100% per year. Now, these tables are all in the book. Remember, so you need to write them down. You'll get that for free at the end. Um, now, this is the best return on investment I've ever made. I wish I could invest my 401k in insulation. Um, that other client I was telling you about uh, is making a 46% return on investment, far better than mine, uh, by cutting his carbon footprint 38%. And he focused on things like insulation, air sealing, which I'll talk about in a minute, and fit from the inside triple glazed windows, which I'll also talk about a little later on. Uh, he did not add the expensive things like heat pumps or solar panels. Uh, so you'll do far more to save the planet from global warming by insulating the ceiling of your basement than by buying an electric vehicle. Insulating the ceiling of our basement saved us seven tons a year of carbon emissions. An EV will save about two tons per year compared to a gasoline vehicle. The insulation will cost you about $1,000. An EV will cost you about $50,000. So it's a no-brainer which one you should do first. So this is what we did in our house. On the roof, we have a flat roof. Uh, we had 10 inches of fiberglass. That's the pink stuff in the middle. And then we added two ISO boards. ISO board is essentially spray foam in a board. So it's very easy to handle and just you just screw it down to the, the joists there. Uh, on top, we put two, two layers of two inches each. That's about four inches, uh, giving us about R50. Insulation is measured in R values. Uh, more is better. And R50 is a very well insulated roof. On the right-hand picture, you can see our basement ceiling. Uh, I installed, uh, I literally pushed these bats of fiber, fiberglass up into the, the, um, the joist spaces, about 12 inches of fiberglass, um, and that's R38. So we now have a very well insulated uh, bottom of the house and a very well insulated top of the house, keeping the heat inside the house in wintertime and keeping the heat out of the house in the summertime. Um, now basements leak almost as much heat as roofs, but most people don't insulate their basement at all. Um, insulating the ceiling will keep the heat in the, in the living space so the basement will get colder. I was got about eight degrees Fahrenheit colder after I put this insulation in the ceiling of the basement. Now, if you use the basement as living space, you don't want to insulate the ceiling. You want to insulate the walls and the floor. But if you're using it as storage, and most of our basement is storage, um, your luggage doesn't mind if it's a bit colder. So we just um, didn't, didn't mind the, uh, the temperature dropping. It, it dropped from nearly 70 degrees in our basement because all of the, um, the heating equipment was down there. Um, and it dropped to about 62 degrees after we did this. Uh, you mentioned air sealing in the last question. Uh, we did not have to do much air sealing on our house because the, the house was very well sealed. And that's mostly because we've got a flat roof. A flat roof has a rubber membrane, which is watertight and hence airtight. Most houses don't have that. They have a pitched roof and then they have um, shingles or uh, tiles of some kind. And those things can be very leaky and leak a lot of air. Uh, and, that, and that is why most houses need both insulation and air sealing. Air sealing is cheap. You literally go around with cans of spray foam and seal up the, um, the places where the, the drafts are coming in. Um, and it can cut energy use 25% on its own. Um, this is uh, my experience with, with some of my clients. Um, and it's also a major academic studies have found similar kinds of results. Uh, our house, to mention, has a pretty tight uh, building envelope anyway, so there it just wasn't much of an issue for us. But most houses do need air sealing and insulation, and Mass Save will pay for the air sealing at the time they come to do the uh, insulation for you. Uh, I'll talk about Mass Save in just a minute. So for most people, air sealing is as important as insulation. It just wasn't a big deal on, on our house. Um, and that client I mentioned who's making a 46% return on investment focused mainly on insulating an air ceiling as well as adding the window inserts. Um, so obviously most people on this call tonight are, are live in Massachusetts, although I've had people on my, on my calls from Turkey, from Iran, from Australia, all over the world. Um, so Mass Save will pay 75% of the cost of insulation and air sealing up to $2,000. And they'll pay, uh, so they'll pay 100, uh, that's the insulation, they'll pay 100% of the cost of draft sealing they will not pay for spray foam, not spray foam for insulation. They'll pay it for spray foam for, for air sealing. Um, so this is a picture of peaches um, on my peach trees in the summertime. And you can see they're, they're so heavy. They're weighing the branches down. You can see the grass there in the background. Um, so insulation is the lowest hanging, ripest fruit in the zero carbon garden. So please pick it by the bushel because it's cheap and very, very effective. Uh, so for details on which types of insulation to put where, uh, there are occasions when insulating walls actually make sense, uh, but only opportunistically. It really doesn't make sense to take a siding off, um, add insulation and replace it. We had a quote to do this in our house. It was $150,000. Um, 
Um, this is a, a common technique in the zero energy or green energy um, community. It does make energy sense, but it makes no financial sense. Uh, and uh, so we spent only $1,000 on the state in the ceiling of our basement, and it's saving us $3,000 a year. And it's cut far more CO2 than buying an electric vehicle. Let's just pause here, Suresh, and take a couple of questions from the chat on insulation. Absolutely. There are excellent questions on chat here, uh, David. Okay. Um, the first question um, is, uh, did you do a blower test to measure how airtight your building uh, envelope is? And if so, what was your ACH50 value? Um, so, so the answer is no, we did not do a blower door test. Um, I, I intend to do one once COVID is over, but I didn't want contractors visiting during the time when, when we had the COVID risk. So, um, so I don't know the answer to your question. Um, I would guess that our ACH50 is probably in the three to five range, something like that. I think it's pretty good, but it's definitely nowhere near that of, say, a passive house, which is 0 0.6 ACH50. ACH50 stands for air changes per hour um, at, at 50 pascals. 50 pascals is a pressure, um, and it's roughly equivalent to a 20 mile an hour wind. So if you imagine your house standing in a 20 mile an hour wind, um, our house is probably exchanging the air in the house probably uh, three to five times per hour. Um, if you have a passive house, which is a super tight building envelope, almost totally airtight, it's like, like living in a Ziploc bag almost, um, those can get down as low as 0 0.6 um, air changes per hour at 50 pascals. Um, but uh, I've not done it on our house, but I do intend to do it more out of curiosity. At the end of the day, I have a zero carbon footprint. I'm saving $11,000 on bills. I don't really care what our ACH50 number is. I have no need to you know, wear it on my sleeve and compare it to other people's. But I'm curious as to what it is. I'm really curious as to how high an ACH50 can be and still get you to a zero carbon footprint because there are people like Passive House out there telling you you need to get to 0 0.6 ACH50, which is very expensive to do. And in my opinion, but I don't have the facts to support it yet, but I guess my conjecture is that uh, this that getting to passive house levels of uh, air infiltration is another one of those things like geothermal that makes energy sense, but doesn't make financial sense. Thank you, David. Uh, another question uh, from another viewer is, have you used a rock salt, which has sound dampening and fire retardant properties, but does not produce lung irritants? Um, yes, yes, the short answer. I have used rock salt, I think it's a great product. Uh, it's a little more expensive than fiberglass, but it does come in a, in a nice rigid board, so it's very easy just to screw it to rafters and things like that. Uh, I've used it sort of opportunistically uh, on uh, insulating our house where uh, for instance, we, uh, we, we replaced the front doors that they were falling apart. And uh, when we did that, we were able to move the, the location of the door by about two inches. And then we added an inch and a half of rock soil um, in that space. So it's a, it's, a, it's a great material. I've used it. Uh, I, I definitely like the, the sound deadening properties and the, the lack of uh, uh, flammability. Uh, flammability, by the way, is, is an issue that is not widely discussed about insulation. Most insulation cannot burn, um, like rock solids, which is made from rock fibers. It, it literally cannot burn. Fiberglass cannot burn. Uh, but you get into things like spray foam, and it can burn. And um, it's not so much that it burns, but when it burns, it burns with a thick, black, toxic smoke. And uh, for that reason, I've not used spray foam in our house. Uh, it is a very effective insulator. Um, it's reasonably cost-effective, although fiberglass is cheaper per R value than spray foam is, and fiberglass is also cheaper than rock salt per R value. Um, but my, my big um, issue with, with um, the foams, all of the foams, whether it's XPS or, um, or uh, uh, the, uh, the, the spray foams, is that uh, they, they just release thick black toxic smoke when they burn. And that's just not a good thing to have in your house, in my opinion, when there are other forms of insulation that are um, as good but cannot burn. And rocks will be one of those, fiberglass is another one. Thank you. And uh, we have uh, uh, a couple of questions uh, on heat pumps, uh, which are very really simple and quick. So when you switched out your central AC units to heat pumps, did you have to redo anything inside your house? Um, so, so yes is the answer. <clears throat> Excuse me. The, uh, the blower fans for the, uh, the old forced hot air heating system which is also the AC system, um, 
the uh, the blower fans had to be changed out. And that's this is something you want to do. Ours were 25, 30 years old. Uh, modern ones are way more efficient, like four times as efficient as the old ones. So you really do want to get new ones. Um, and uh, the interior unit is called the air handler unit. That now works with the thermostat and with the outdoor unit. They all operate as a system. So replacing one part of the system is not going to get you the benefit of a modern heat pump system. You really need all three to talk to each other um, and for the thermostat to be controlling what's going on with the flow of refrigerant around the system. So um, when you replace your AC units, you'd almost certainly, and I would highly recommend, replacing the whole thing, not just the outdoor unit, which will be replaced with the heat pump, but the air handler unit will be replaced with ones with modern variable speed motors and um, and much, much better performance than the, the, the old ones. So I would definitely recommend uh, replacing the whole thing. Thank you, David, for that excellent answer. And one last quick question. Have you calculated uh, relative savings uh, with heat pumps compared with natural gas heating? Um, yes. So I'll actually um, talk about this a little bit later on. I've got, got a chart on this, but roughly, roughly, if you measure for the same amount of heat in the house, which we'll call one kilowatt hour of heat in the house, um, the cost of producing that from a natural gas furnace is about five cents. The cost of producing that heat from an oil-fired furnace is about seven or eight cents. The cost of producing that from just electric resistance heating is whatever your utility charge is, 23 cents in my case, uh, about 12 cents in your case with little than electric. Um, so, um, so it's much more expensive to heat with electricity than it is with um, natural gas or, uh, or uh, a heating oil. However, if you heat with a heat pump and you're heating, let's call it 12 cents with little than electric, and your your um, your, uh, uh, your your coefficient of performance or your efficiency of your heat pump is two and a half times, then your cost is about five cents per kilowatt hour of heat in the house, same as it is with natural gas. This is what I mentioned earlier. Because of your cheap electricity, you can just go straight to a heat pump and get the same heating bill. You get a much lower carbon footprint without having to add solar panels. Most people, when I give this talk, I talk about adding solar panels as well as heat pumps because that, then your, your price of electricity drops to about six or seven or eight cents per kilowatt hour. And if you've now got a, a, a performance and a coefficient of performance of say two and a half times, you're now at about two cents, two and a half cents per kilowatt hour of heat in the house. Well, that's half the cost of natural gas. So the cheapest way to heat your home today is to heat it with heat pumps powered by solar panels on your roof. Because that combination gets you heat in the house at about two and a half cents per kilowatt hour compared to even the cheapest natural gas today, which is about five cents per kilowatt hour. So it's about a 50% reduction in your heating bill by having solar panels on your roof and a heat pump to heat your house. Now with Littleton Electric, it's not quite as good, uh, not quite as favorable as that. And with Littleton Electric, you could, you could afford to just go straight to a heat pump you wouldn't save much in terms of bills compared to natural gas. You would save compared to heating oil. You wouldn't save much compared to natural gas, but you would cut your carbon footprint dramatically. Thank you, David. Please go on. Okay, so that was um, insulation. Uh, let's go on. If you've got other questions, please uh, ask them at the end. Uh, let's talk about triple glazed windows. So triple glazed windows uh, were the smallest cut in our carbon footprint, about two tons per year. Uh, money saved about a thousand dollars. The incremental cost. Now I'll show you in a minute pictures of our windows. They were ancient 1970s falling apart double glazed windows, um, and so we were going to replace them anyway. So the question for us was: Do we replace them with double glazed or with triple glazed? And the incremental cost, the additional cost of the triple glazed over the cost of the double glazed, was very small, only about five thousand dollars, about five percent. Um, and that incremental cost pays for itself with the incremental savings, that money saved per year, $1,000 sounds quite small. That's because it's the additional savings above and beyond the costs, uh, the savings of double glazed windows. So for us, our decision was not, are we gonna rip out perfectly good windows and put in triple glazed ones? I don't recommend that at all, but do we replace with double glazed or with triple glazed? And there, the incremental cost more than paid for itself with the incremental benefit paying for itself in about four and a half years, a return on investment of 19%, that's after tax. Um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, 
all these uh, all these uh, returns are after tax. If you were to compare these returns to say a stock market investment or a bond market investment, those returns are pre-tax. So if you're getting say five, six, seven percent in um, in the stock market, um, then uh, that's uh, that's pre-tax. So the um, the after this <laughs> the pre-tax return you'd have to make in the stock market in order to get the same after-tax return as nineteen percent would be something like. 25 30 percent maybe even 40 percent return these are impossible returns to get um in stock market investments so that's why i think these things are such good value for money because they earn you a much better return they've certainly been earning me a much better return than i could get anywhere else um, by making uh, other types of investments um, now if your windows are not rotting or, or broken or falling apart like ours were what can you do you can, you can add something called window inserts, which I'll come back to in just a moment. So let me just show you our, our, our windows. These are our um, windows on the left here. You can, you can see that the panes have misted up between the panes, um, uh, uh, moisture has leaked in between them. These are 1970s double glazed windows in metal frames. And on the right hand side, you can see there were gaps between the sliding glass patio door here and the frame because the house had subsided a little bit. Uh, and I literally sealed it up with duct tape. There was a, about a one inch gap where the wind was just whistling through the frames there. Um, and what I'll show you now is the new ones. Uh, hopefully you'll agree these look much nicer. Uh, you can see the garden out of the windows. This is our living room. Um, and these are our houses we're talking about. We're not, it's not just about saving money and, um, and, and cutting carbon. It's also about how they look and how they live. And this is our living room. Our living room now is warm enough year round to even even in the coldest weather to, to be pleasant. Beforehand, it was actually very difficult to have Christmas in our living room because it was too cold. There was a lot of drafts off the windows, there was drafts through the windows, and with no insulation in the basement, um, we were just uh, getting very cold in that room. So this uh, Fab Four um, overhaul of our house not only lowered our carbon footprint, not only saved us money, but it's made the house much more livable much warmer, fewer cold spots, and it's pleasant to be in our living room, even in the, in the depths of winter, which it never used to be. So let's talk about how triple glazed windows work. This is a cross section of a triple glazed window. There are three panes of glass, hence triple glazed, um, and two air gaps, about half an inch each for the air gap. And the low E coatings are invisible. They are a, actually a very thin film of metal applied to the outside. And what that does, it reflects the light, uh, particularly the ultraviolet light, which is the very strong type of light that gives you a sunburn and fades your photographs and carpets on the inside of the house. That light is reflected away from the house um, and uh, by a coating on the outside called a low E 180 coating that reflects away the ultraviolet light. However, it does not reflect away the visible light. And the visible light comes through the window, keeping the, the house nice and light and sunny, but um, not overheating in the summertime. Now imagine it's winter time and you've got the house at 70 degrees, it's maybe zero degrees outside, um, and your body and your room is emitting heat or infrared light. And that infrared light is escaping out of your windows, taking your heat and your dollars with it unless you have an I-89 coating on the inside. This is a different type of low E coating that reflects the infrared light, the heat back into the room. This keeps you much warmer in the winter time um, and keeps your, your body warmer and, and the room warm as well. All the time, the visible light is coming in. So the room is nice and light and sunny. Now here is me modeling triple glazed windows. Um, if on the, on the left-hand side, you've got me wearing a t-shirt there. Uh, that is like a single glazed window. Is there's, there's really no insulation. It's just a barrier to the wind. Um, then I've got a green sweater on. This is like having a double glazed window. I've got one air layer trapped now against my skin, keeping me nice and warm. Then if I put on a second sweater, the blue one there, I've got two layers. This is like a triple glazed window, two layers of air trapped, keeping me warm with insulation. Then if I wrap myself around with one of those shiny foil space blankets that will reflect the, uh, the, the infrared light, the, the heat back to my body, keeping me even warmer. That is like the triple glazed low E coating because that's reflecting the infrared light back to my body. So if you have single glazed windows and we had some in our house, it's like going outside in winter in just a t-shirt. That would be crazy. Having single glazed windows is equally crazy. Now, as I mentioned, if, you, if your windows are in perfectly good shape, you can still uh, greatly improve the performance of your windows by adding a window insert. 
and um, this is this is at the uh, upstairs at our rental property. Um, this this property has um, single glazed windows in this uh, uh, traditional New England style with the double hung windows where the, the two panes move up and down, um, and with the divided lights there, the cross hatching of the of the windows. And you can buy windows that just fit. They push fit into the frame, and you can see this one here is made by Inner Glass. Uh, in the book, I actually go into four different manufacturers and evaluate each one in turn. In the glass is the one I found was the best performer of all of them. Um, and you just push fit it into the frame and it stays there inside the frame of the window. Um, you can see in the middle here an infrared picture. Infrared is measuring the temperature. And in this picture, uh, yellow is warmer and purple is colder. And if you look carefully, you can just see 63.3 degrees. That's the temperature of the glass there in the middle. Now this is with the window insert included. On the right hand side, you can see a control window, very similar window, but with no window insert. And you can see the window temperature here is about 40 degrees. It was about 30 degrees outdoors on this day. Um, and uh, so if you were sitting in this room and you were sitting in this room in front of that 63 degree window, um, you'd be feeling perfectly warm. Uh, there'd be, you wouldn't be feeling cold at all. However, if you were sitting next to the 40 degree window, there'd be a cold draft across your feet as the, as the cold air moves down the window and you'd be feeling very cold in your face because there'd be no heat coming to your face from, from that window. So uh, these things are very cheap, they're about 200 bucks each, uh, and they pay back in about five years. Um, now, in addition to the additional R value, the insulation, they also are very good at eliminating drafts. So if you have drafty windows, and a lot of us do because we have these double hung or single hung windows, which are very, very difficult to seal from drafts. And yet, uh, if you put one of these window inserts in, it will seal the drafts as well as um, provide extra insulation value. Uh, they also reduce noise considerably. So if you've got noisy neighbors or a noisy street or something, these are very good value for money for, for a couple hundred bucks. You can eliminate the noise, um, improve the insulation and eliminate the drafts as well, making the room much more comfortable to be in. Uh, so for details on all this, again, it's all in the book, um, uh, and uh, you'll get that at the end for free, uh, particularly which types of low-E glass I recommend for different locations. You need a different type of low-E coating for a south-facing window compared to a north-facing window, and my evaluation of those four different window inserts, that's all in the book. Um, and I don't recommend that stretchy film. I have used it. It is effective, but it takes the paint off the window frames when you try to take it off, um, all in Chapter 4. So let's pause here, Suresh and uh, see if there's any questions on triple glazed windows. Well, um, I'm gonna be uh, unmuting everyone so that uh, everyone can ask, uh, can unmute themselves uh, and ask a question directly to David so that we can have a live Q&A. There was one question that uh, one participant had asked and uh, that question was that if, um, as to, for different income level folks, uh, how would you recommend that they go about doing uh, go about um, doing a zero carbon home? Uh, so I would I think a very good case study is that the gentleman I referred to here, uh, who's been one of my clients. If you if you don't have much in terms of budget uh, to invest in these things, then uh, the best place to start is insulation, insulation and air sealing because those have the best return on investment, very very high, and they're very cheap to do. Uh, in Massachusetts, mass save will pay for most of it. So you can get an awful lot done for just a few hundred bucks. Um, if you put, say, uh, $2,000 is what mass save will subsidize, and they'll subsidize 75% of that, so $1,500. So for you, you spending $500 on insulation, you get $2,000 worth of insulation, which is enough to do most homes. Um, and um, that will probably save you $1,000 per winter. So for 500 bucks, you save $1,000 in the first winter. So it's a very, very quick payback um, on, on insulation. Mass save would also pay for 100% of the air sealing. So that will um, uh, probably have a, a huge return for you. So I would definitely start with insulation and, and air sealing um, uh, first. Um, if uh, you want to go a little bit further, then I think the um, you can even make your own um, of, of these uh, window inserts. Now you can buy them for a couple hundred bucks. I made some of these myself. I went, I just bought wood strips from Home Depot, put that stretchy plastic film around it. This recipe is in the book. You don't have to take it all down right now. 
Um, and uh, that that is very cheap. I made three windows, six foot six tall by three foot six wide for under a hundred bucks. Um, and they're very effective. They don't look as good as the ones you can buy for 200 bucks, but if you're on a budget, this is a very cheap way to, to really cut your, um, your, uh, your heating bills from your windows. Um, and then if you move into more expensive things, um, they, they are more capital up front for heat pumps and for solar panels. However, for solar panels, you can lease them. And leasing them does cost you more, just like leasing a car, it costs you more than paying cash for the car. Um, but uh, nevertheless, you, you don't have to put the money out front. So if you're on a tight budget, then in getting uh, solar panels under a leasing arrangement can make sense for you. And then heat pumps, um, you can't get them on a lease, but you can get the heat loan, which is a 0% interest rate loan backed by the state of Massachusetts. So um, you can borrow the money for seven years at 0%, by the time the seven years is up, you'll probably have paid back the loan on the heating bill savings. So that's a little bit trickier to do. You do have to actually get the loan. You have to have a reasonable credit score to do this. But, um, but there's a lot of things you can do, even on a very tight budget. I would start with the insulation in the air ceiling, maybe make your own triple glazed windows, and then um, probably get the heat loan for the heat pumps and get a, a um, solar lease for the solar panels. Thank you, David. Uh, I have um, now all the participants can unmute themselves. Uh, there were a couple of questions from Howard Lee. So Howard, if you want to ask your questions live to, uh, to David, uh, please go ahead. Oh, hi, David. Uh, excellent talk. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Go ahead. Excellent. Uh, excellent talk. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really vividly clear. Uh, the question I have is it, this, this is all good and people should do what they can as individuals and as households. Would you care to comment a little bit about the other side of the equation, the, the societal wide um, efforts that need to be made also to um, limit the impacts of climate change? Uh, well, I don't do politics, particularly not on, on calls like this, so I'm not going to get into that, to be honest. Uh, what I find is um, is uh, missing for a lot of people is a lot of people want to cut their carbon footprint. They know it's the right thing. They should be doing it, but they get really stuck when they start investigating what should they actually do. And they start getting all kinds of contradictory information from contractors and even from websites and blogs and things. And people end up just being really confused. And as a result, they don't do anything. And so one of the reasons I do these webinars quite frequently, I do them almost once a week, um, is precisely to help people get over that hump, that hump of uncertainty, that hump of misleading information, um, because uh, there are about, um, uh, what, 100 million homes in the United States, all of them are already built. So uh, we can cut the carbon footprint on those homes, we collectively can cut that carbon footprint to zero, or at least very close to zero, um, and everyone can make money doing that. So I think the, the um, and, and those policies are set by the government because the subsidies for solar panels, the subsidies for um, heat pumps, et cetera, are set by the government. Net metering is a big subsidy, again, set by the uh, regulators of the utilities. So within that framework, I found this recipe that allows you to get to a zero carbon footprint and make money. Um, that recipe is out there. I think it's gonna be out there for a long time to come. Um, I, if anything, it's probably going to get more generous under the current administration than under the last administration. But um, I'm really not going to get into politics because I just find if ever I do, I, I lose half the audience. And uh, my, my goal is to get as many people as possible confident in making their own changes to cut their own carbon footprint for whatever reasons they have. Like I said at the start, I really don't care who you vote for. It doesn't matter to me. I'm just focusing on how do you save money by cutting your carbon footprint. Thank you, David. I think uh, there are a couple more questions. Uh, I uh, I know Hugh Fortmiller has uh, another question. Hugh, you want to ask it uh, yourself? Uh, sure. Thank you, David, for your uh, help. We have an extremely old house, 1760. It does have ductwork and um, two furnaces uh, and two outdoor AC units. I, 
I have one question about that, and that is the exterior heat pumps that appear to be not unlike uh, air conditioned compressors. Uh, how do they uh, feed hot air into the existing duct system? Okay, so let me just uh, to make sure I understand you, Hugh. So you've got AC units, which is obviously going through the ductwork. Does your hot air go through the ductwork yes, as well? We have, we have hot air with natural gas furnaces. We have okay, so, so it's very similar to the situation at my house where we had he heating oil, not natural gas, but it's the same thing. We had a furnace burning the oil to make, uh, make, make the heat. And then in the furnace, there are copper pipes that circulate water between the, the, the heat of the furnace to the, um, the air circulating fans. And uh, then there's another set of copper coils um, in the air pathway, which, which heat up with the hot water from the furnace, and that warms up the air that flows around the house. That is exactly, you leave all that in place. Don't touch that, leave that in place. And then you add a new air handling unit. So where your current um, AC system has the air handling unit, and in fact, th there'll be a blower fan in there uh, to blow the, the hot air around for the, um, the, the when, when you're heating the house, that will be replaced with a, a new um, blower fan, but it's still a blower fan that's gonna push the air around the house, whether it's heating the house or cooling the house, but the source of heat will now be from the heat pump. You'll leave in place that fossil fuel uh, heating, heat exchanger coil because you might need that on a really cold day, but there'll now be two heat exchanger coils, two coils of, that provide heat into that airflow, one from the furnace and one from the heat pump. And so um, that's how, both of them both of them work together. This is exactly the setup I have in my house. Um, it was very easy to do. They literally carted away the old blower fan units and put in the new blower fan units that have that heat exchanger for the heat pump and then replace the old um, condenser units of the um, air conditioning units outside the house with those new heat pumps you saw earlier in the presentation. Okay, second question, uh, similar. Uh, do the heat pumps replace the existing uh, air conditioned compressors that are currently uh, working on electricity? Um, so yes is the answer. So the heat pump will replace both the air conditioning system and it will, it will uh, replace most of the functionality of your heating system. It won't physically replace your heating system. I suggest you leave that in place. So you leave your natural gas fired furnace in place in case you need it on those bitterly cold days in winter time. But uh, the bulk of your heating will now be done by the heat pump um, until that point where it can't keep up on bitterly cold days in the wintertime, and then your fossil fuel furnace will come on. Um, now, this is controlled by the thermostat. You don't even, even need to think about this. The thermostat just knows when the heat pumps can't keep up, and it turns on the natural gas furnace. So it's a completely seamless system um, combining the two systems of the uh, natural gas furnace with the heat pumps, and you, you won't even notice the difference. Okay, one last quick question. I, I don't want to, uh, I know there are other people who want to ask questions. The inner glass units that you showed in uh, one of your uh, yep. displays, uh, it, it, does one put those in the same way we used to put in the old fashioned um, uh, storm windows? Do you put them in for the winter and take them out for the summer so you can open your windows? I mean, you've got that same issue of how tight can you make it uh, if you are putting them in and taking them out? Um, so, so you can put them in and take them out. They're designed to do that. They, they fit. Um, the, the, the frame of the window insert is just slightly smaller than the frame of your window. And you measure this before you order them. Uh, but then there's a rubber gasket or uh, like a foam rubber strip around the outside. And that's just compressible. So when you push fit it into the, into the frame, it squeezes that gasket tight around the, the window frame and that blocks the air draft. This is one of the, the big benefits of these uh, window inserts is they block the drafts. And since most people, and I'm sure in your 1760 house, you've got double hung windows, um, they are almost certainly extremely drafty. Uh, they, they're drafty even on modern houses, let alone on, on 1760 houses. Um, so, uh, so, th so the window insert will block the draft as well as blocking the uh, increasing the R value, the insulation value of the window by making it essentially a double glazed window instead of a single glazed window. Okay, thank you.
Welcome. Thank you, David. Uh, Sarah Rambacher has uh, a question here. Uh, Sarah, do you want to ask that question yourself? Sure. You yourself. Sure, thanks. Yeah, we actually have, we have a hundred year old house that's just really oddly shaped and configured and cathedral ceilings. And um, we had someone come out and look at a heat pump and it was just extremely complicated and expensive to switch to a, an air system. So I was just wondering what the alternatives would be for keeping the, the forced hot water system. And one thing I'd heard about was a wood pellet boiler. I'm just curious if you had any thoughts on that or any other ideas. Um, so I, I've never used a wood pellet boiler myself. Um, they are fairly popular, so, um, um, but I don't have any experience, so I can't really advise you on that. Uh, but, but going back, I just want to ask you a question. So um, you, do you currently have a forced hot water system? Yes. And is there any AC, is there any AC system with ductwork? Nope. Okay, so how do you do air conditioning in summer or do you not? Uh, we have trees. <laughs> okay. Um, Occasionally we put a window unit in, but mostly not. Okay, so um, if you've got forced hot water heating, then um, you can do the air source heat pump to forced hot water systems. That I mentioned this earlier, they're made by different mm -hmm. companies, the air conditioning companies, they're made by uh, Jaeger, Daikin, and Spacepack. These names are all on my website. If you want to go and search on my website, you can find it uh, rather than try to write it all down now. Um, but um, I've never used one myself, so I don't know. Um, and I would, I would, before going into something like this, I would try to find some people who've got this um, air source heat pump to force top water system because I just have no experience of, of, of having it work. Now, the one place where I know it does work is if you have radiant heating. Um, and uh, we're, we're doing a renovation on uh, one of our rental properties where we will be putting in radiant floor heating. Um, it's not particularly expensive. Uh, and that will be run by an air source heat pump that is outputting hot water, but it's outputting the hot water at about 110 degrees Fahrenheit, which is the perfect temperature for underfloor heating. Um, most baseboard radiator systems, forced hot water systems, are designed to have hot water at 140 degrees Fahrenheit, which is why it's, it almost burns your fingers when you touch those radiators. And um, there's no heat pump today, heat pump um, air source heat pump today that can output 140 degree water temperature. Um, and so what will happen is it will take more time for your house to get up to up to the temperature you want it to be at if you just replace your um, uh, your your fossil fuel furnace with a heat pump to distribute the water. Um, so but it, it should be able to keep it warm, but it just won't get there as quickly as it has done uh, with a fossil fuel furnace. Now, what I recommend is you don't take out your fossil fuel furnace if you go this way. Um, if you go this way, leave the fossil fuel, fossil fuel furnace in place. The thermostats will be able to uh, use both systems and manage both systems. So if the house is not getting to 70 degrees with the heat pumps, it will switch on the fossil fuel furnace. So I wouldn't recommend going with a um, forced hot water system uh, with, without having your without keeping your, your backup um, heating source. Um, just because I've never had the experience, you don't want to have that experience of having cold rooms in the middle of winter time. So keep your fossil fuel furnace, and then your worst case scenario is maybe you burn a bit more fuel than you were hoping to, but at least you won't have cold rooms. Thank you, David. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to the next section before we go into more question and answers. Uh, so David, uh, proceed with your... Uh, solar panels hey. and keeping in mind that uh, we have cheap source of electricity. <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, so this electric. section will be less important to, to you guys because you've got cheap electricity. So everything else I've talked about before applies equally no matter what your price of electricity. But solar panels are not going to be as good value for you. So perhaps I'll, I'll spend less time on this tonight than I normally would. But even with Littleton Electric at, say, 12 cents per kilowatt hour, um, I, I've just installed two, just purchased, not installed yet, two new solar panel arrays, and they're going to be making electricity at six cents per kilowatt hour. And they're in good but not great solar locations. They get a good sun but not great sun. So six cents per kilowatt hour is dirt cheap and half the price of what you're paying even for Littleton Electric. So 
Um, so with, with that caveat, let's just, just keep going. So for us, this was the, uh, sorry, for us, this was the, um, the second biggest cut in our carbon footprint, about 14 tons, uh, about a, a third, saving us a lot of money. Now, of course, your savings will be probably half this uh, for the same investment. So your payback is going to be longer, probably more like 10 to 15 years rather than seven years. Um, and the return on investment might be more like seven or eight percent. Remember, that is after tax and index for inflation. So even so, it's a still a very good return compared to the stock market. And uh, the levelized cost of energy is, is well below even little and electric rates. And it's about a quarter of Eversource called National Grid rates at about 23 cents per kilowatt hour. Now, that is the money savings. And that is different for Littleton versus uh, Eversource or National Grid. However, the increase in your house price will be the same. Uh, this is based off an analysis of 49,000 houses across the US in every climate zone, every heating fuel. And they showed that our house, for instance, is increased by a uh, house price is increased by about $111,000 installing the solar panels alone. You'll notice the net investment was 42,000, the increase is 111,000. So more than double the cost of the um, solar panels net and your cost will be the same as my cost. Uh, in fact, this cost is now several years out of date. Um, my, uh, uh, the current uh, arrays I've just put in place cost less than this net for the same amount of electricity and the cost per kilowatt hour generated is lower than my first array. My first array was about eight cents per kilowatt hour. My second array about 11 cents. The two new ones are about six cents. So this house price increase means you no longer have to wait that payback period of seven years uh, to get your money back because if you do sell your house, you would get the money back right away. Now this is, um, this is for solar panels. And if you work it out as a percentage, it's somewhere between four and 7%, exactly the same uh, increase in the house price as from adding the heat pumps, which was published in Nature Energy in October last year. So both of these things add substantially to the value of the house. So this is really a breakthrough. You not only get paid to cut your carbon footprint by the savings on the electric bills, even against little than electric, um, but it increases your house price too. Um, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this because this is a little bit different in uh, where you are, um, but you can produce um, power very cheaply. Um, the two new ones I just mentioned, are uh, one is at six cents, one is at eight cents per kilowatt hour. That is including a backup battery. Backup batteries in Massachusetts are heavily subsidized. And if you pair a battery uh, I've bought two different types of batteries, one from Generac, one from Sonnen. I've not bought one from Tesla because Tesla won't deliver. Um, but it, uh, even, even with those batteries from Sonnen and uh, Generac, which are more expensive per kilowatt hour than the Tesla batteries, I'm still getting um, returns on investments in these arrays with the batteries of one is 10%, one is 13%. So, and this is because of the subsidies in Massachusetts that are very generous. So uh, this is to me a very good reason to be investing in solar panels because the subsidies for batteries are so good. So if you have a, a, a problem with power outages in the winter time with the, the grid going down with trees falling on the lines um, and you want to get a, 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 either a battery backup or you want to avoid having to put in a propane or diesel generator, now's the time to do it, even in Boxborough. Um, because these subsidies are good uh, no matter where you live in Massachusetts. Um, so let's just move straight to questions here on, uh, on solar panels. Suresh. So there are no questions, but there are a few comments. Uh, and uh, I would let uh, uh, the folks make their comment. Uh, Chris uh, Delise, uh, you have some comments. Do you want to unmute yourself? Uh, and... <laughs> It was a while back. Um, yeah, I was I was kind of curious about um, uh, you know we we don't we don't have a natural gas generally speaking in town. A very small number of people, relatively speaking, have it today. So mass save doesn't really apply. Which I was just looking it up while you were speaking that the that the heat loans are only available if you're a mass save um, yeah. customer. Um, so that that puts us at a disadvantage. Um, I found that that's why you uh, have 11 cents per kilowatt hour electricity. Reason <laughs> oh, yeah, no, we, we, we get it one way or the other. Um, yeah. I, I found that buying insulation in bulk at, at Lowe's uh, cut the cost by about half over the normal. If you're willing to install it yourself, which is a, you know, not a fun job, 
um, you can you can get get a lot of insulation uh, for not terribly much money, and it makes an enormous difference. Um, I, I agree, Chris. I, I couldn't believe I was saving three thousand dollars a year by insulating the ceiling of my basement. I, I like you. I went to I didn't go to Home Depot, but I went to a local store and bought yeah. the insulation. I just installed it myself. It took a weekend. Three thousand bucks a year. I couldn't believe how much money it was. <laughs> it's just totally amazing. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I, Thank we you. have another question uh, from uh, from Ed Weizak. Uh, can you explain how you make money on the battery? Uh, so, so batteries are complicated, and the subsidies are a moving target. So, um, if you if you want to go into this in more detail, there's a lot of written answers to to people's questions like this uh, in my webinars uh, that I've written up on my website. So if you wanna to go to the website and just search for batteries, uh, there's a search function on the website to search for solar and batteries or something like that. There's a lot of information there about how to make batteries work for you. But the short answer is um, if you uh, buy a battery and you pair it with a fairly large solar panel array, by fairly large, I mean at least 10 kilowatts, maybe 15, even 20 is better, um, then the subsidy for the battery is based off the amount of electricity produced by the solar panels. It's not mm -hmm. related to the battery itself, it's related to the solar panels. It's about four cents per kilowatt hour. So a, tenth, a ten, 10 kilowatt array would make about 10,000 kilowatt hours per year. Um, so that's worth about uh, 400 bucks um, per year. And that uh, smart subsidy lasts for 10 years, that's $4,000 in total subsidy from the solar panel array for the battery. Well, the battery is gonna cost you maybe 15. If you buy a Tesla one, it might be 12. Um, so you've just knocked off $4,000 from the smart battery adder, it's called. It's added on top of the uh, direct solar panel subsidy. On top of that subsidy, there is a subsidy from Eversource. Now you don't have this where, where you guys are, um, so I won't talk about that one, but that, uh, that, that's about uh, over $1,000 a year. And then there's another one um, which you are eligible for called CPEC, C-P-E-C, which stands for, I'm not sure what it stands for now, um, but um, the CPEC one is run by the state. So it's not run by Eversource, it's run by the state. And that has a similar goal to the Eversource program, which is to um, reduce the peak emissions. Um, from from uh, from uh, power plants uh, during peak uh, peak load times, usually in the summer when everyone's running air conditioning, and so they pay you a subsidy for being able to draw on your battery uh, during peak load on the grid because that allows green power to go onto the grid during what would otherwise be the dirtiest time of the year and the dirtiest time of the day. So um, that subsidy comes from the state. So. Um, that is not as, as generous as the Eversource subsidy, but nevertheless, it's going to be money in your back pocket. So if you combine all these subsidies on the batteries, and to get the best subsidy on the battery, you need a fairly large array, um, then the battery can be almost free. Uh, where, where I am, uh, the, the two batteries I've just bought, the internal rate of return is 10% on one of them and 13% on the other one, including the battery. Those are very good rates of return uh, and I'm getting that battery back up to replace these um, old and defunct propane generators. So um, that, those are sort of the components of doing it. It's not going to be as generous in little, with the Littleton Electric because you're not going to be getting the connected solutions subsidy. Um, however, I know there's at least one of the uh, municipal light and power plants is now offering a similar subsidy to, to the connected solutions program. So I think you should check with your utilities to see if they are doing anything in this area um, because, and, and if not, lobby for it, because um, this is a great way to subsidize batteries as backup generators for homes that, uh, that don't have them or have propane or, or diesel generators today. Thank you, David. Uh, at this point, uh, there, uh, we, are, we have been doing this webinar for almost an hour and a half, so um, I'll ask, uh, the participants to unmute themselves and uh, raise their hand and go to reactions. And uh, at the reactions, there is a uh, raise hand button and I'll allow you to come on and ask the question directly. So Michael Nathan, uh, please uh, go ahead and ask your question. Thank you, Michael. 
Here. Please unmute yourself. Uh, there, am I on? Yes. Sorry. Right. Um, David, thank you so much. Very interesting uh, session. We have an eight kilowatt uh, solar array, which is clearly benefiting us colossally. And we've put in heat pumps. The uh, We've actually done most of this, but I had thought about expand. We, we did, the solar array does not cover our entire electric bill after the heat pumps went in. And I had thought about expanding it to do so, especially maybe with the batteries and the current uh, uh, rebates and benefits that the electric company gets from it, but was told we couldn't go over 10 kilowatts without losing net metering. And I just was wondering, it, and it was told that that was a huge decrement in the payback period. I don't know if you've looked into that or if that's true at universally. Um, so yes, I've looked into it and um, taking what you said at face value isn't quite true. So it maybe something got lost in translation there. So so what happens, this is the this is the um, state net metering program. So this is nothing to do with Eversource or Littleton Electric. This is the state program for, for net metering. Um, if you go over 10 kilowatts, you get something called market net metering. Uh, which does reduce the uh, amount of the net metering credit, which is one for one below 10 kilowatts. So if you put one kilowatt hour out of the grid, you get the financial benefit of exactly what you paid, would have paid for that kilowatt hour had you bought that from the grid, that's one to one. But above 10 kilowatts it is reduced to 60% or market net metering. That's what it's called, market net metering. And it's 60% of the retail value, not, um, not the full retail value, but only on the excess production ah. in, in that month. And this is done per billing period. It's very complicated because it's done per billing period. And so what ends up happening is if you, so I, I know these numbers off the top of my head for Eversource. So if Eversource is, is charged like 23 cents, um, 23 cents uh, retail, then the net metering credit, if you have a say 15, 20 kilowatt array is about 18 cents. When you take account of the net meter, uh, the, take account of the uh, market net metering, for, but it's only on that excess um, solar production in the month in which you uh, produce it. Um, in the months in which your solar production is less than your usage, you're getting 100% uh, net metering credit. It's only in those months when you're producing more solar power than you're using, which would typically be the summer months, um, that you're not getting full credit. And you're still getting credit on the 10 kilowatts. You're just not getting credit on the anything above that. And producing more because you have the excess um, coverage for, you'll be, you'll be producing closer to the 10 kilowatts than you would have without the extra panels. Um, but, well, so there's two separate questions there. One was about um, the yeah, yeah. market net metering, and, and it's, it's not as bad as it sounds. It's certainly not a crash. It's not. It's not a um, a cliff edge where you go over 10 kilowatts and you get zero. You don't. You get 60 percent of the production over your consumption in that building period. So All I was saying was that if I have if I have 30 percent more um, area. I get 30% more energy. So in the month that I would have only gotten six kilowatt production, I'll now still be under, but get substantially more and get that payback. Uh, I didn't quite follow that, Michael, but- So if, if I have eight kilowatts now and I go up to 12, even in a time when I'm only getting 10, I'll get more than the five kilowatts I would get now on a cloudy day. Oh yes, definitely, definitely. Um, so I still think it'd be financially worth your while to expand your array, particularly if your um, uh, your heat pumps have probably probably pushed your electricity usage up considerably, mm -hmm. um, so um, so I, I think it would be financially uh, worthwhile if the eight kilowatt array, array is paying for itself nicely. I think you, your additional array probably will. How good is the sun in the place where this array is going to go? We have excellent sun both on the gar garage roof, which is what we'd expand, where we'd expand, and on the uh, on the main house, so we have we have we get eight kilowatts out of it. Okay, so you'd probably be looking at five cents per kilowatt hour of uh, the cost of electricity production from those uh, arrays in, in full sun, and that's half, less than half, what Littleton's charging you. So I'm not um, Littleton; I'm Eversource, so it's a. Quarter. Are you Eversource? Oh well, it's a you'll be making money hand over fist. Then I, I would do it tomorrow. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, Howard, right, thank, you so thank you. Howard Lee has uh, his hand up, and I think he has a comment that uh, folks who are in Boxboro uh, will not get any net metering. Howard, you want to unmute yourself? 
Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah, just David, just um, Littleton have their own um, special rules. So we went into this last year, we put a, a big uh, 20 kilowatt um, DC uh, array in. And for that, we don't get any net metering, we get zero. As soon as you go above that threshold, so I forget what it was, not only do you, you don't just not get any um, net metering on the excess, you get, you get zero. Um, okay. We we did some um, Excel stuff and we reckoned we'd still be ahead, especially since we put in heat pumps, like you said. Um, and, you know, so far that's panning out um, pretty well. We're still saving much more uh, than anything that we would have lost by keeping the size low and getting the net metering. Okay, so so uh, Howard, next time I do one of these for a uh, municipal life and power uh, zone, I'll have you on the call with me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I just saying, you know, just we, we went through the mill with Littleton yeah. um, on this uh, last last year. But I, I'm actually serious, Howard. I think you you've got an excellent example there of how you sort of made it work despite what looked like uh, very challenging. Uh, reimbursement policies from the utility. I did not realize that um, MLPs um, have different net metering rules. I thought those net metering rules were statewide, but obviously there's an exception for, uh, for uh, the Littleton plant. But uh, if you've got an example there, Howard, of how to make this work, I strongly encourage you to write it up, get it on a website, uh, write a blog or something, because people need to know how to do this. Otherwise, there could be hundreds of people in Boxborough sitting there not doing this, feeling they should be doing it, feeling they want to do it, but afraid of making the decision because they don't know it's going to save them money, but you can show them how to do it. All right. I'm not sure that my math would be meet your high rigorous standard, but. Uh... <laughs> but what, what, what I found, Howard, is the, the, the first person testimonial neighbor to neighbor is the most powerful thing. You don't need my Harvard Business School trained financial analysis. I mean, I do this to people all over the world. So obviously I, I think I do need to have a higher standard there that everyone can buy into, but you're talking neighbor to neighbor over the fence about what's worked for you. You don't need to do this with the level of detail that I have done. Um, just showing people what you did, show me your electric bill, show me your heating bill. I, sometimes this stuff, we can overcomplicate this and uh, you've got an example that works, you're happy with, please just spread the story. Howard, uh, Boxborough Sustainability Committee will lend you a hand to write a case. There you go. Study. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Thank <laughs> oh, you. boy. Thank That's you. That's the second, second time I've been suckered into that one. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, we have been going on for an hour and a half. I know there are a lot of questions. This is a vast subject and a uh, lot of questions, a lot of interesting comments as well from people who know more than uh, others. Uh, and uh, please, uh, you know, um, we'll have another forum to have more questions. Uh, otherwise, please engage with David Green on his website. And uh, at this point, uh, I would like to call it a good night. Uh, and thank you very much uh, to everyone for joining the uh, session. And thank you, David, for uh, your uh, excellent seminar and excellent uh, pointers that you have given us. Uh, sincerely appreciate your time Let me and your, show uh, you uh, uh, how to contact me. Here we go. So if anyone does have uh, follow-up questions, my email address is there at the bottom. Um, uh, if you want to get the free book, go to my website uh, for iPad or for Kindle. Uh, just type in the code ZCB for zero carbon box per. It'll be free. Sometimes this does not work. If it does not work, email me. Um, and uh, and I can, I can email you the file directly. So sometimes browsers don't talk to each other or something like that, and it just doesn't work. So if it doesn't work, email me. I can email you the file instead. Um, so, uh, and then you can get the YouTube recording of a previous version of this webinar if you want to go over it again, if I was speaking too fast or something. Uh, and you can download a PDF file of the slides for the webinar as well. So it's all available there. If you've got any questions, uh, please email me directly. And I will write up the Q&A from this webinar um, within a few days, and I'll email it out to everyone within a few days' time. Uh, but any other questions, please just let me know. Thank you, David. Thank you, Thank David, you. so much. You're very welcome, everyone. Thank Good night. You. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone.